Hello, greetings everyone, whichever the time zone you're currently in. Um, my name is Aleksandar Boskovic and I'm a lecturer in Bosnia and Croatia and Serbia and here at Columbia uh, Slavic Department. And I'm also co-director of East Central European Center at the Harriman Institute. Um, and the, as you may know, today's event is a part of both East Central European Center academic programming and Njegos Endowment for Serbian Language and Culture lecture series. Uh, and due to the Njegos Endowment, we are able to organize at least one of these events per semester, which are devoted to Serbian language and culture uh, in broad sense. In this semester, we have two events. Um, on April 6, we will have a lecture by Žarka Svirčev. Uh, that lecture will be devoted to the role of women in Zenitism which was a Yugoslav avant-garde movement. And I also invite everyone uh, to join us for that lecture as well. You can register through the link posted on the Harman's website. Um, today lecture, however, focuses on the artistic treatment of identity issues in the historical novel of Ivo Andrić, which was, as, as we all know, the only Serbian slash Yugoslav Nobel Prize winner for literature. Um, and I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, uh, Professor Tihomir Brajovic, who teaches South Slavic comparative literature at the University of Belgrade in Serbia, and who is currently a visiting professor at Hankook University for Foreign Studies in Seoul, Korea. Uh, and Professor Brajovic is author of many books, uh, such as Poetics of Genre, Theory of Poetic Image, Forms of Literary Modernism, Identical Difference, Comparative Demagogical Essay, Comparative Identities, Serbian Literature Between European and South Slavic Context, as well as two books specifically devoted to Ivo Andrić's work, uh, Fiction and Power, Essay on Ivo Andrić's Subversive Imagination from 2011, and Fever and Feet, Essay on Erotic Imagination in the Literary Work of Ivo Andrić from 2015. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to his lecture today. Uh, but before I turn the floor to our guest speaker, I will remind you that you can post your questions using Q&I button if you are following us on Zoom or using live chat if you are following us on YouTube. So without further ado, welcome Professor Brajovic and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. I'm very glad to be today with, with you and at the beginning I take opportunity to send greetings to my colleagues, friends and of course students in Belgrade. Long time no see so hello. I'm also you know, greet my colleagues and students in Korea if somebody now uh, watch and hear us and uh, for the beginning I'll open my presentation for this lecture. So identity representation in the novels of Ivo Andrić. Just a sec. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to list my, sorry. Okay. Okay. So, uh, for the beginning, here is a short biography of Andrich, Ivo Andrich. For those who maybe don't know much about this author, as you can see, Andrich was born at the end of 19th century. And in fact, uh, he belonged to very famous modernist generation of writer from ex-Yugoslavia. So I name other uh, famous writer from that generation like Miroslav Krleža, Miloš Crnjanski and Tin Ujević. Also, so all, all of them uh, were born in the range of a couple of years. And I'll mention now um, one other person, Josip Broz Tito, ex-president of 
former Yugoslavia, who is in fact uh, who was born the same year as Andrich, and that that was of course personality who influenced all human lives in Yugoslavia at that time. Uh, Andrich was uh, very politically active in his youth, and in the time of uh, First World War, uh, he was in prison sometime, as you can see, because of his relations for uh, revolutionary organization Young Bosnia. After First World War, uh, he was in dip diplomatic service all over Europe. After Second World War, he was on high positions uh, in culture organization in uh, Yugoslavia. In the meantime, he wrote and published his famous novel and narrations. And of course, he won Nobel Prize for Literature in 1961. He died in uh, 1975 in Belgrade. So, I'm starting with uh, his uh, Nobel Prize speech. So in, yeah, in his acceptance speech on the occasion of receiving the Nobel Prize for Literature delivered 60 years ago from now, Ivo Andrich expressed his view that narration, be it in oral or in written form, comprises the real history of mankind. This often quoted view on the anthropological significance of narration was accompanied by the observation that narrators of all times always speak of the same problems pertaining to the lives of the individuals and collectives and as he said thrown into the ocean of existence and forced to carry their own identity it, as is well known for the most part Andrich famous novels are shaped in the form of fictional narratives on life in the period ranging from the beginning of the 19th century to the beginning of 20th century. Napoleon's campaigns, the first Serbian uprising, the annexation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, the Balkan Wars, the First World War, those are globally and regionally significant events that functioning as a kind of historical framework delimitate the narrative and on established habits and dazzling novelties that dramatically and irrevocably change the lives of the domestic population as well as those of visitors from the great world outside. Hence, one might say that these narratives in fact obsessively deal with identity crisis as an epoch-defining phenomenon. Andre's literary and especially narrative style was often considered as realistic in broader sense of the term, which means that literary scholars usually think and write about this author as a writer who is closer to novelistic tradition of previous times than to a modern literary practice. In my opinion, that could be correct on, let's say, external level of understanding, namely, Andrich was really not very inclined to stylistic and formal experimentation, although in his early poetry we can find even such examples. On the other side, and, be, and it means on internal level of understanding, his novels show us implicitly and I dare to say deeply modern aspect of this art. What I want to say is that in his novels we can find modern narrative skill in manipulating narrative perspectives, their imminent comparison, confrontation, and juxtaposition, which is one of the most important features of the modern novel art. We need to remember just authors as William Faulkner, James Joyce, Herman Brock, and others. This specific skill is perhaps possible to recognize already in general orientation of narration in the Andrich novels. What I try to say is namely that specific nature of Andrich novelistic creations has to do with the fact that as a rule they are presented not from the center but from the political and geographical periphery of real 
centers of power and important historical events, which decisively influence on realistic characters and communities in a manner of speaking. In the far off cities from which this region was run these days, there prevailed one of those rare lulls in human relations and social events. That is how the narrator of the novel The Bridge on the Drina describes general circumstances towards the end of the 19th century, which brought significant changes in Europe and also in West Balkan, adding that something of that lull was felt even in these God-forsaken regions, which were reached only by broken echoes of all that lives. The auditory metaphor of broken echoes in the times of Congress, but was alternatively replaced by visual metaphors. But the meaning remained virtually the same. The upheavals and change in the distant capital were echoed in the remote province changed to the point of caricature, like something in a distorted mirror. That is how the narrator of the Bosnian Chronicle speaks of the troubled circumstances at the beginning of the 19th century, not so different to that of the century end. Because of that, the distorted mirror metaphor seems to me a convenient way to summing up the notion of history presented not only in the episode referred to above, but also to a large degree in all Andrei's historical novels. In fact, it suggests a kind of cognitive deformation of historical events in local reflection, especially in keeping with the advantages psychological and mental position from which they are observed. It is important to say that comprehensive view, which in a way frames civilization and epochal horizon in this art, could also be given in a manner which puts different points of view one against other. In this particular quotation we can see on the screen, we see how even traditionally reliable omniscient narrator is able to confront opposite point of view, use inside just one sentence and thus produce ironic effects. Namely, narrator may confrontation between universal suffrage, it means general voting rights, and universal military service. Both are modern society traditions, but first is considered to be good one, and second not so good, but sometimes necessary. By simply putting them together as object of authorities manipulations, and also by ironically naming arena of military service, narrator makes a relative general opinion about goodwill and intentions of free elected governments, here called in a manner parodic rulers of human destinies. And the fact that narrator mentions province town on the periphery of empire as small but eloquent example of global contagion, it means infective disease, allows us perhaps to compare this kind of narrative art with other similar cases from distant times, such as, for instance, novelistic art of famous French writer Henri Bell, better known as Stendhal, especially his book Charter House of Parma, or perhaps Gabriel Garcia Marquez's famous novel Hundred Years of Solitude, published almost 130 years later. Both of them are also based on pattern of small but eloquent example because Stendhal's Parma, just like Marquez Macondo, no matter if they are real or pure fictional, provide us the same opportunity to extend spatial proportions and understand much bigger historical tendencies and civilization relations from kind of inverted, figurative minimized side, which reveals more, more clear its contradictories and previously not so obvious sides. Above explained example from the bridge on the Drina novel shows us therefore Andrich's artistic 
capacity to suggest presence of different perspectives even in the phrase or a sentence. Thus, we could speak about Adrich's need and will to think about people's relations to reality as a matter of mental perspective, and such conception belongs to eminent modern way of representing human experience. Okay, now I have once again problem with listing my... Yeah, I think you selected that image, so maybe you want to click on the side um, and okay. enlarge the whole okay. presentation. Okay, okay. Thank you. Every human generation his, uh, has its own illusions regard to civilization. Some believe that they are taking its absurd, others that they are witnesses of its extinction. Uh, that's how the chronicle narrator of the novel, The Bridge on the Drina, sententiously puts collective point of view of fail, fallen angels, young generation, just before First World War, adding that civilization, in fact, always burns, smothers, and it's extinguished depending on the place and the angle of view. And these knowledge, in other words, really do not even try to attain so-called objective historical truth. Although the author himself was a historian who, as we saw, achieved PhD level and who, of course, knew what means writing historical works in accordance to scientific methods. Instead, those novels shape kind of complex narrative mosaic or puzzle which is consists of different individual and collective perspective representations. Because of that, and what has been said, narrative method, which we find in Andish historical novels, offers us, in fact, imagologically fertile field of relativistically separate and cognitively competing notions of historical events and their significance in the lives of individuals and communities. As scholars know, imagology is a branch of comparative studies that deals with cultural and collective representations or mental images about other and ourselves, with special attention on stereotypes and cliches which people produce in their personal opinions and social lives. So, imagological angle of understanding make it possible to concentrate on identity problems and specificities. Thus, for example, the introductory chapters of Bosnian Chronicle following the process of the adaptation of the recently arrived French consul Daville to the living conditions in his new surroundings in Travnik city, whose reality entirely unknown to him seemed like a dream in the course of which one gets abruptly thrown into strange, far-off land and placed in an unusual position. True, even before that his life unfolded in the manner of dreams, for in the turbulent historical circumstances following the fall of the Hundred Years French monarchy, under the gridstone of the revolution, all things crumbled, changed and vanished. But it was only when he found himself lost in these wilds that he was totally devastated of illusions, so that it seemed to him that nothing in the world could be resolved or reconciled. That is why he appeared to himself later as a man with a certain name, of a certain calling and rank, who suddenly was foreign, multiple and at times entirely unknown to himself. <clears throat> the real Bosnian experience of foreignness as fearsome alterity, which brings into question the previously compact notion of his own identity, is presented through the encounter of Western secularism and individualism with Eastern superstition and collectivism. Resistance to this disturbing experience of self as fearsome alterity arises in the sphere of Davil's imagination and its self-defensive notions, which in its final form have been 
conceptualized in the fiction of his unfinished epic poem Alexandrite as a some kind wished for vision of history. This poem, as narrator observes, shows all of the wheels loading of the East and of the Asiatic spirit in general, expressed in terms of his hero's struggle against distant Asia. However, inside it, Bosnia too came to life as a barren country with a harsh climate and peopled by an odious race, but under the name of Tauris. So, like Ruritania, for example, from the historically and geographically exotic British fictional narratives of the first half of the 20th century, Tauris, or Taurida, as you can see on this slide, probably evokes the name of the ancient Greek province, represents a kind of rudimentary mythological, that is, developmentally inverse and therefore civilizationally regressive construction, in fact. And on this map, we can see that Tauris or Taurida is in fact a space of today's Crimea with its turbulent history through, through the time. So this imaginary blending of the not so far off Bosnia with so distant Asia within the framework of a leveling image of barbarous Levine and menacing East results in an imagological commonplace that testifies to the real effect of the previously mentioned distorting mirror of modern history within the boundaries of Andrich novels. By appropriating the imperial heritage of the era of antiquity as exclusively his, imagining the real and concrete Bosnia as a distant Asia, and constructing Taurida as the equivalent of that near far away existing non-existent country, the French consul actually presents himself as a typical representative of Eurocentric worldview. Established as basically ignorant construction of the dominant and internal West, as opposed to the rudimentary mythical Orient, as Samir Amin observes in his instructive study with the same title, Eurocentrism, relies on the ideologically invasive concept of a progression of Western history from ancient Greece through Rome to feudal Christian and capitalist Europe. Even though it passes itself off as a triumph of humanist universalism invented in Europe, Eurocentrism, in fact, as Amin points out, using similar term which Andrich narrator already did, distorts said Amin, the universalist ambition on which it claims to be founded. In the same light, it is possible to read the masterfully written sections of Bosnian Chronicle that ironically and satirically present the consul's struggles and stratagems following the arrival of the Austrian consul von Mitterer as picturesque consular storms in a teacup how narrator described travnic circumstances of that time. As the narrator observes, behind all these attempts on the part of the Western representatives to outwit each other high officially, but really just as bloody fighting cocks, all the time there is a depression due to the unusually difficult circumstances under which an enlightened European must live in these wide mountainous regions. Instead of humanist universalism, then these newcomers from the West, when directly confronting the local circumstances, unfailingly manifest ignorant exclusivism. However, Andri's skill of confronting narrative views and cultural perspectives makes it possible for us also to take a look at the other oriental privileged side, which surprisingly or not, manifests very similar attitude towards the Bosnian and the Balkan reality as Occident privileged one already did. Thus, we find out that even during his first meeting with French consul, the Travnik vizier Topal Pasha 
did not fail to point out the wildness of this country. Nature here is crude, the people are impossible. Nothing these people did or said have no any significance or importance or any effect on the affairs of serious and enlightened people. Except for the fact that these words are spoken by the authorized representative of the greatest Eastern Empire of that, of that era, in all other respects, they actually correspond to Eurocentric stereotypes about the wild periphery of civilization and could therefore be understood as some kind of historically adopted and culturally, it means orientally disguised Eurocentrism. Such an understanding remains essentially unchanged, even by the fact that Turkish authorities occasionally manifest barbarous manners themselves, as in the cruel scene when salted human body parts are thrown in front of the consuls. Irrespective of the real historical, cultural, and confessional differences compared to the Eurocentric, it means West European view, the above explained attitude is namely also marked by hegemonic aspirations which, coupled with political power, invariably lead to an ignorant and dismissive attitude towards a weaker, powerless other as civilizationally unsuitable and actually unrecognized in its peculiarity. But in the historical novels of Ivo Andrić, there also exists even third, little bit surprising kind of reciprocal, now locally and regionally distorted and stereotypically exclusive notion of oneself and the other. <clears throat> no one in Travnik had ever supposed that the town was made for an ordinary life and everyday events. The narrator says as early as the beginning of the first chapter of Andrich's Chronicle of the Con Time of Consuls, adding that the local residents were guided by a feeling that they were somehow different from the rest of the world, made for something better and higher and competent to attain it, established quite literally in accordance with an exalted, proud and unattainable notion that they had of themselves and their, their town, this positive auto stereotype reaches its culmination a little bit later in the self-proclaimed image of Travnik as the most lordly city on earth and the comic arrogance of its inhabitants. It seems that there exist no obstacles to designate this locally shaped superlative self-image as peculiar, peculiar inversion of the omnipresent Eurocentric notion of identity, but now ironically diminished to Balkan proportion and thus perhaps indirectly and satirically called into question as imperative need for exclusive and exaggerated self-understanding. Theoretically elaborated, that notion produces the already established West European concept of Balkanism, which Maria Todorova, in her well-known and influential study Imagining the Balkans, designates with a degree of critical reservation as a discourse of imputed ambiguity with the result that the Balkans are constructed as incomplete selves, in best case made for imitation of other selves. The ambivalences of that incomplete self, be it only imputed or also adopted and interiorized by the Balkan cultures, we can easily recognize in the episodically shaped narrations about irrational conflicts, brutal struggles, as well as unexpected alliances between confessional and cultural communities in Ivo Andrich novels. But they could be traced even to personal identity representations, which are also very often shaped as ambivalent and incomplete, internally divided and contradictory selves. I shall mention here only two important and similar literary uh, characters. Mehmet Pasha Sokolovic from the bridge on the Drina, 
and Omer Pasha Latas from the late unfinished novel of the same name. What interests me more than historical credibility is their literary figuration in accordance to previous explained affinity. Both above mentioned characters were narrative depicted as converts, men of West Balkan and Slavic origins who accepted Islamic religion and after that became Ottoman Turkish dignitaries and high positioned figures in the imperial hierarchy. So, on this level of interpretation, I not think in the first place on collective than on individual identities. Although they are, that is clear, inevitably related to cultural belongings. But what is particularly interesting me here is that narrative circumstances offer a possibility of crossing borders, which in collective presented relationships looked impossible in Andrich novels. Now we meet two characters that have opportunity to be on both sides of cultural borders because they represent what can be called our aliens. It means identities which are mixed or confused from traditionally monolithic point of view. In difference to collective opinions and attitudes, which are almost constantly marked with cultural prejudices and stereotypes, in cases like these two, some kind of total life change make that individual thinking and acting inclined to already known patterns only just after become, become, become existentially shaken and questioned. Mehmet Pasha Sokolovic's life story shows that in an exemplary manner. After he was cruel taken as a boy in so-called blood texts by Ottoman forces, he became a young and brave officer at the Sultan's court, then great admiral of the fleet, then a general who waged wars that were for the most part victorious on three continents and extended the frontiers of the Ottoman Empire. This new man that he had become in foreign world, says narrator significantly, must have forgotten all that he had left behind him. Becoming successful military official, Mehmed Pasha also became eminent political figure inside one of the greatest and multicultural empire of that time. His oblivion of homeland and origins is consequence of assimilation by empire system, which shaped his political identity as supra-ethnical, supranational, and proto-modern in a way. And all of that in spite of the fact he had to adopt official Islamic belonging as a kind of ceremonial cultural code more than a real faith and religious belief. In this context, it is quite significant that Mehmed Pasha's construction need, which leads to Visegrad bridge building, has been culturally and also politically motivated with wish to link safely and forever Bosnia and the East, the place of his origin and the places of his life, as narrator said. So it is possible to say that his constant feeling of discomfort, which had remained in him, and which had never completely disappeared from his mind, in fact represents neurologic symptom and disorder sign of that new modern political and also personal identity in the making process. On the other side, Omer Pasha Latas, the other literary character we mentioned, shows what happened in progression and some kind of extreme result of that culturally historic process. Similar to Mehmed Pasha, he is described as former Christian who converted to Islam and then through his knowledge, skill and personal merit, risen to the highest military position in the empire. What narrator named as knowledge, skill and personal merit is precisely what could be described as content of modern personal identity range required from new pragmatic type of social institutions which have not special interest in cultivating all kinds of old collective sentiments. 
in deference to Mehmed Pasha, who finally reminded his original identity, Lapras put all behind him and even came back to cruel prevent rebellions and uprisings in his old homeland. When he appeared there, as narrator noted from Bosniak's point of view, there was something about this slender, strong man that was alien, brazen and provocative, that went against their whole concept of imperial service. This means that he is not only strange to them as ex-compatriots, but also as proper representative of foreign power. Even more, during the meeting with local leaders, Omar Pasha looks almost inhuman and grotesque because he gave the appearance of a silhouette cut of the black paper or as a kind of Mongolian mask. In fact, says narrator, he spoke like a businessman with a trace of anxiety about order and authority. Connection of modern business personality with care for order and authority with his exterior look, which at the same time makes grotesque impression, shows very suggestively what encourages and also makes problematic this kind of new grow, growing manhood. Effectiveness and discipline in pragmatic affairs are most important features which are personalized in Omar Pasha Lata's figure. That features, however, prevent humanistically individual shaping of the self. Because of that, Lata's persona shows up as diffuse and high unstable in comparison to traditional understanding of human self. On the other hand, it is very productive and successful for official purposes it serves. Not without irony, narrator designates him as a man who has overcome his destiny. Impossible in old-fashioned way of thinking, which presume that man is rather object than subject of destiny, this point of view expresses, in fact, arbitrariness of modern growing subjectivity and inherent social relations. Pragmatic, efficient, successful, but also cruel and personally undefined or even distorted to the large extent, Omer Pasha Latas from Andrich's novel could be considered as a kind of man without qualities from West Balkan, because his personality in which are strangely melted orientally archaic and occidentally modern features. And, and this very point becomes possible to note that Andrich's novelistic figuration of identities perhaps has not only cultural but even politically subversive side. Namely, Omer Pasha, Latter's pragmatic power and also military strong political personality can be and it already did in some scholar and also memoir works, interpreted as kind of allegorical figure. At the time of novel's creation, that artistic pr procedure could be perhaps necessary because of fact that there was one personality who also had unlimited political and military power and who was unquestionably authoritarian leader very well known to Andrich. That was, of course, Yugoslav President Josip Broz Tito, who was also Marshal of Yugoslavia, which is practically the same title as Seraskev, that one which bears Pasha Latas in the novel. The fact is also that Yugoslavia was multicultural and multinational, and during Tito's rule, communist state and communism in a certain way could be understood as one of leading imperial politics forces of modern times. This set of significant interpretive theses, of course, raises questions about their semantic quality and range, as also about other similar possible cases in Andrich's narrative art. In my opinion, the same thesis could be applied to, to other Andrich's late works written after Second World War, namely to Vizier Elephant's story and short novel The Devil's Yard, both 
offer certain possibilities for politically allegorical, allegorical reading, which I already tried to explain in my books about Andrich. Having no space for more detailed interpretation this time, I can only add that allegorical reading here is not privileged and exclusive, but one of possible alternative outcomes of understanding. That is important to keep in mind if we want to interpret Andrich correctly and successfully. As regards main subject of this lecture, at the very end, I want to summarize it short. It seems to me that with inevitable simplification, all previously exposed leads to next possible conclusion. Representations of identities in Ivo Andrich narrations are marked with mental or intellectual distortions, which are consequences of subjective limits and the impossibility of its real overcoming. Be it collective or individual, local or continental, cultural or political, identity understandings in this imminent modern art confront us with contradiction which could be designated as one of crucial paradoxes of our time, and that is irreplaceable lack of completeness, wholeness and real communication in spite of the declarative and passionate need for them. The fact that this paradox is artistically shaped mostly in regional Balkan relations doesn't mean, as we saw and understand, that this is, this is not to apply to much wider, even global relations. After all, our, our own contemporary culture and political experience testify to that more than suggestive and convincing almost every single day. So that's it. Thank you so much, Tihomir. This was such a rich uh, presentation with a lot of field to cover. Unfortunately, we didn't see the whole um, PowerPoint presentation, no. but um, oh. but okay. Sorry. I guess like we we can we can uh, in Q and A um, go over over some things. Um, you covered a lot. There is uh, uh, there are like three big novels you were talking about, Bridge and um Bosnian Chronicle and Omer Pashalatas, the, the last of which is uh, published posthumously, but um, was also re reflected in scholarship. Um, and I really liked um, uh, the theoretical part of your talk with um, Eurocentrism and, and Maria Todorova's mm -hmm. Balkanism uh, edition. Um, I do agree with you completely that, uh, that the topics of identity um, are uh, locally colored in Andrich's work, but they're also universal. And uh, uh, I do share your opinion that they uh, transcendent that uh, area of uh, so-called Balkan area, right? Um, um, it, it is also interesting how you uh, used uh, a, a language to describe these contradictions that are um, immured to use another Andrich's uh, metaphor, immured in the um, phenomenon of identity. Um, you said at some point that um, there is uh, this uh, Crimea area as explained as near far away. Um, and this is something that remind me uh, eerily of uh, Walter Benjamin's explanation of aura, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which is how he reads uh, the upcoming modernity where the uh, where the work of art loses its aura, right, uh, which is okay. completely uh, outside of the of the field of identity per se, but does show uh, this clash of the world as we knew it and the modern impulses, um, and also geographically, it's not limited, of course, on uh, on Balkan per se. Um, so I would invite everyone to pose the questions. Um, if you have any comments or questions, please do so. Post in Q and A uh, and also on chats in chat live chat on YouTube. Uh, but maybe I can start um, start from this uh, um, very notion that you mentioned uh, of near, far away, or our aliens, right? Soy tuj, uh, something that was in scholarship uh, addressed. Um, do you see that um, that Andrich represents in a similar way not only 
these subjectivities that you mentioned, uh, but also um, how that representation of identity relates to the very um, uh, foreign subjects who are coming to the Balkan, namely, for example, con consuls uh, or, um, or, or you characters. Mean, you mean aliens, as aliens, uh, our aliens? Uh, you said that, yeah, notion of our aliens would 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 be uh, um, something to explain characters such as Omer, Omer Pasha Latas and yes, Mehmet Pasha yes, Sokolovic. Yes, yes. But I'm, my question is, how does that relate to the figures that he describes who are aliens coming to the Balkans, who people not from the Balkans coming to the Yeah, I think it is, it is clear from my uh, expose that, that uh, Davil and von Mitterer became aliens to themselves to previous to previous selves uh, which they, they they were before coming to bosnia so uh, they changed also uh, they it is interesting i have i had no time to explain all of that of course but <laughs> that is in my books uh, and who read andrich uh, can see that very clear if if you read uh, 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 with uh, attention of course so when they came to Bosnia, for, for a while they started to behave as Bosniaks. Uh, they adopted their manners and in habits. So they changed, they uh, even maybe uh, don't uh, observe that, but they uh, changed also uh, Bosniaks changed according to the new habits of the new world, modern times and uh, similar things. But that lasts that last, uh, some time and after that everyone uh, go back to old habits. That's interesting. Andrich uh, was pessimistic about uh, possibility of uh, real change. It's, it's clear uh, when we read his novels. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I do definitely agree with you that this distortion that you mentioned um, um, does not spare anyone, right, in a way, uh, specifically yes. uh, because the setting is on this periphery of empires, right, or so-called in the shadow of empires. Um, can, you, can you say a little bit more about um, whether do, whether do you find in, um, in other 20th century authors, um, Serbian or Yugoslav, uh, similar notion of this uh, stereotypical uh, self-representation that you mentioned as a third stereotypical self-representation of people in Travnik who think that they are, right, they're something special, they're made for something bigger, right? Oh. Uh, I think uh, Andrich is uh, a bit unique in this manner. Yes, of course, we, we can recognize something of that, let's say, in uh, Krlezer's novels, but in a different manner presented. Uh, not so many uh, juxtapositions of perspectives as in Andrich's novels. Yes, Krlezer was also very critical to our habits, to our self-representations, but in a bit uh, direct, more direct method. Uh, we can find something in uh, Cernyanski's novels, of course, uh, uh, in Migrations, cycle of three, three books, uh, but uh, in, on individual level, of course. Pavel Isakovic and so on. So uh, I think really Andrich is uh, quite uh, unique in the first half of 20th century. Second half is a little bit different because of changes uh, the, that was made uh, that, that were made in uh, conscious of li literature in second half of. Century. Mm -hmm. 
what came to my mind is uh, actually Con Radomir Konstantinovich, who is writing about this self-isolated society that does not want to have contacts with others, but at the same time pertains this like really high image of themselves, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think there is a little bit of that in Andrzej. Of course, it's a different genre, right? Konstantinovich yeah, writes yeah. that. I use I use Konstantinovich in my books about Andrzej. Yes. There, there is there, there, there is a similarity, so big similarity, in opinions of Konstantinovich and Andrich fictional presentations. Yeah, and that, that is actually fascinating, and I think um, yeah, I'm glad you brought up that you did write about it. So, uh, uh, so that's something to to refer to. Um, another another thing that um, I was uh, I wanted to ask you is that. In Andrich, because of this change of perspectives and, and uh, multiple views that are simultaneous and coexistent, usually one thing functions differently on different levels, right? So, so that kind of discomfort, for example, that Pasha Sokolovich feels would also function for positive things, right? To, to overcome yes. it. And can you say absolutely, a little bit? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yes. Can you? Say a little bit more about it, or uh, offer us your 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 reading of uh, one of the examples, if you will like. Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, look, uh, I also wrote about a kind of hero uh, characters in Andrich novels and stories. So he pretty often uh, shaped. Uh, kind of convert character like this. There are I I cannot say lot lot of other convert characters, but there are con converted characters which uh, uh, experience uh, soul change and uh, personality change. So uh, very often they uh, change to a worse, not to a better. So uh, Omer Pasha Latas is an uh, example of that bad change. But Mehmet Pasha is example of opposite change because he reminded his uh, homeland and he did something very good. He built uh, a bridge which stands even today as uh, some kind of monument of this change. So uh, there, there were not only uh, bad changes, there were also good changes, but not so often, uh, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah. And uh, also on the language of, uh, on the level of description, on the level of use of language, uh, it's interesting how Andrić uses these metaphors in order to describe this this discomfort, he's using this uh, metaphor yes. of Crna Pruga, right? Of this yes. uh, a black yes. uh, black line, right? And yeah, later yeah, on, yeah. later on, he will use the same uh, description to describe the railroad that comes with those yes, Hungarians yes, yes. as a sign of modernization. Yes, yes. Uh, so it's very interesting how nothing is one dimensional in his work and everything kind of changes its function throughout the novel, depending on the context in, in which it occurs. Um, how does that you think connects to the whole like notion of identity um, that you so well read uh, and then presented on today? You think of these stylistic uh, moments? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I wrote, uh, in fact, I have, even the third book about Andrich, uh, uh, <coughs> Oblivion and Repetition, that, that's uh, the title in translation. Oh, okay. And it's all about uh, the bridge on the Drina. So I, I wrote very detailed about uh, just about these uh, moments, about uh, black uh, line or arrow uh, in Mehmet Pasha's soul and the mental uh, position yes that that is very significant and even in connection of stylistic manner and uh, symbolic meaning 
of identity questions. Uh, so I have a dozen, a dozen uh, pages about that. It's it's very it's very interesting. Uh, it's characteristic of modernist writer writers, as I can say, uh, because uh, when we read the good, great modernist writers, every time we find something new. Andrich was such a writer. Cernyansky was such a writer. Krleža was such a writer. I, I'm talking now about South Slavic writers, of course, but uh, in a wider range of European and uh, world literature, we can find a lot of uh, mo maybe more significant, of course, writers. So when we when we read uh, again Thomas Mann or Proust or uh, any other modernist writer, every time we find something new because they they uh, thought very uh, very very lot about these details, uh, not only stylistic symbolic symbolic points of uh, 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 change of uh, conscious or something similar so for me it's very inspirative to read again these these writers and these novels every time i find something new and surprising surprising i can say yeah yeah that that is a uh, definitely a sign of of uh, good literature that every new reading um we we've discovered something else um and uh, and these writers that you mentioned are um uh, maybe the most well known uh, south slavic writers that offer offer that uh, joy of of rereading um uh, I also liked how you use and introduced um, concept uh, Maria Todorova's concept and specifically quotes that you uh, that you selected, uh, in which you compare what is the difference between so-called Orientalism and Balkanism itself, uh, where. Um, um, there is in Orientism this difference between different types, right? While well, Maria Todorova is saying that in the terms of Balkanism, there are differences, but in within one type. Uh, and the quote that you uh, also um, um, shared with us is that um, that the Balkan subject is constructed uh, not as other, but as an incomplete self, right? Yes. Uh, and this sounds uh, this sounds very modern. Actually, yes. this is right. Or postmodern, or postmodern, yes. or even postmodern. Uh, can you? I mean, I have in mind uh, Lukács's um, uh, uh, Lukács's book on on modern novel, right? Mm -hmm. On this like loss of subjectivity, basically yeah, yeah. that is permanent, right? Um, can you say something about about that? Uh... When I when I uh, was writing uh, my my book uh, Fiction and Power, uh, that is book about late Andrich works, uh, Vizier's Elephant, uh, Devil Yards, and Omer Pasha Latus, I I found something very interesting. Andrich changed not only his style, but uh, his uh, uh, perspective of things. So Omer Pasha Latas is unfinished novel. And in my opinion, Andrich came right to the point of difference between modernism and postmodernism. Of course, he was not postmodern author, but he saw something on the other side. When he uh, writes about Bosnia, he writes about two pictures, one real, one almost unreal. Uh, he he wrote, wrote about something which uh, is question about what is reality, in fact. And that is, uh, as Brian Mihail says, one of the crucial things of postmodernist fiction at all. So I think he... Uh, he was didn't he was he was not able to finish this novel because of that things he was a very dynamic author inside he started as a almost pure realistic writer 
and at the end of his career and his life he came to the very different point of course there there are also possible other reason of not finish the book because I really think, and some other authors also think about that. Uh, for example, Per Jakobsen, very, very well known Danish Slavist, that uh, in uh, Omer Pasha there is something of Tito, of course, not, not all. It's, it's not uh, parabola, simple parabola, but there is something. Aldrich was uh, a true believer in Yugoslav state, but in his uh, late years, I think he saw that things uh, getting worse and worse. And uh, he knew, although he was very high positioned in uh, culture hierarchy of uh, Yugoslavia, he knew that uh, it's on Tito's position and people around him and he depicted all that circle uh, church circle let's uh, let's say ar around the uh, Omer Pasha Latas. all of them are not real people as as uh, Omer Pasha himself they are uh, like mechanisms Andrich writes about mechanisms of people very interesting and uh, as I said, at the edge of modernism and postmodernism, but he was man of modernism. He was total man of modernism, and he couldn't do this without uh, a great broke, of course. So, uh, in his late years, he wrote he wrote about uh, impossibility to finish. It seems he he wrote. I'm finished. I, I cannot finish this book, and that's how it how it was. Yeah, yeah, that is interesting. What you're saying that the it is it is not parabola. I agree with you completely. But there are some um, some uh, features that that could lead a reader to make analogies to the president yes. of Yugoslavia, the marshal. Uh, specifically, also the novel is set in uh, 1850. 1851 ending in with 1852, which is 100 years later, time when the self-management system was introduced, right? Yeah, when yeah. This, like... there, there, there are also some uh, parallelisms. So, uh, Andrich started to, to write over partial letters in the uh, 1960s. Uh, and that's the time of uh, economic reforma in Yugoslavia and in the novel when Omar Pasha came to Bosnia that's time of uh, try of reformation of uh, Ottoman Empire so there are analog analogies between two systems in a way of course not uh, literally right right um, another thing I wanted to ask you is this um, notion of class on one hand and empire and on the other notion of uh, religion or nationality in the, the balkan area uh, how and you said at some point that um, that pretty much for example these um, foreign consuls like deville uh, he was uh, on a par in terms of he understood uh, the same language as Vezir was saying, because they're both men of empire, right? Uh, and they yeah. kind of like felt close. Um, and that is obviously some kind of class uh, question behind uh, that. Yes. But but how Andrich represents the the different nationalities and religions and, and religions and how much uh, that notion. Um, is figuring i mean there are very different examples and we cannot kind of address yes, all of them but yes, can you yes. say something uh, it, it's a very complex question of course problem so we cannot uh, absorb uh, this but uh, it is interesting in uh, the bridge on the drena he uh, writes about our people yes he he make differences uh, among uh, Christians and Muslims, 
also among Muslims itself, uh, it means uh, Turkey, so and domestic Muslims. But when we when when he writes about uh, relations of domestic people and uh, foreigners, he always writes. He's narrator, of course. Uh, he always writes about our people. Our people. So uh, here we we also have some changes of perspective, uh, depending on relation. And uh, in my in my book, uh, uh, Oblivion and uh, Repetition, I wrote, I wrote about that uh, that uh, changing role of narrator. In my opinion, that is also uh, Im imminently very modern narrator. Because that uh, this narrator uh, identify himself with uh, this community, Bosnian mm -hmm. community, community of our people, as he as he says. So it is very interesting. Uh, it is complex question, and uh, I think uh, it would need uh, a whole book to not to explain all, to try to. To say something about that, but uh, Andrich is uh, more, more, much more complex author uh, than uh, some uh, interpreters think. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely agree with you, and specifically, as you said, it's it's visible how um, how how skillfully he changes the point of yeah, view yeah. Uh, with this narrator who is at, at one point very distant from the events he describes yeah, yeah. and at many true. points he is among the people with in the center of the events yes, right yes, where yes, that events yes. happening and he's kind of like a camera quite, from quite so yes yeah and um yeah, of course, for, for something like that, the close reading is necessary and we, one has to work with text. It's hard to, to, to do it orally in discussion uh, like yes. that. Um, uh, great. Um, I think I, I don't want to also keep you up. And um, is there anything else you would like to uh, mention or? No, I, I think uh, I, I, have, I have spoken a lot. So, if you have something, or our listeners, yeah. So far, we got it. some. We got some comments, uh, which are more uh, expressions of support, and uh, people who are sending greetings and thanking from Belgrade, Madenk and Dark, rather than um, questions. Uh, but thank you so much. I think it was a really um, a rich presentation, and. Um, uh, thank you for for taking part and participating in uh, in the lecture series. Yes, uh, uh, I I want to thank you again, and it was really honor for me to to speak for your university and this platform, of course. Okay, well, let's leave it uh, here, and um, hopefully we'll we'll stay in touch and and hear and read more from you. Okay, of course. Thank you. Bye.